Hey, hello. This is Mitch Sacchiaro in response to the video by Theologica 37 called Secular Ethics, Utilitarianism. It's a part of a series he has made on failures of secular ethics. In this video I'm doing, I address the reasonings of utilitarianism he perceives as flawed, counter-arguing or making his reasonings more complete from the perspective of someone who is factually utilitarian. Now, given that in Theologica's profile and in his other videos his general stance on ethics is clear, I think I should make it fair by speaking briefly on my general perception of ethics to give a better understanding of where I stand. I do not condemn nor praise religious beliefs. I think they are very much a private personal matter. Whether you're a religious believer, an atheist or an agnostic, I do not really mind nor do I support you nor reject you solely in basis of that. I do believe that people are free to believe whatever they want in that regard, and thus since they're both believers and non-believers, both a theistic and a non-theistic approach to ethics are necessary and useful. Even that the freedom of belief, this free will in a democracy should be protected and reinforced, from a law and government perspective, for example, it is clear that ethics that stick to no particular religion are of utmost importance, while we can also uh, benefit from religious people being more ethical. If they are unwilling to change their religion or unwilling to stick to no religion, provide them ethics that makes sense within their beliefs and that succeed in being ethical. Uh, myself, I generally do not have any religious belief of, of any kind, neither atheistic one, and for the most part I am consequentialist utilitarian. So let's go. Theological. You go on about utilitarianism being indefensible, tautological, circular reasoning. Uh, descriptively indefensible it is not, as I am defending it here, so it is not indefensible. As for tautological or circular reasoning, possibly, but I don't see how that's something bad. I don't know if you're familiar with Agrippa's trilemma. It says that whatever you use to prove a theory, it will be either a circular argument, proof supporting itself, a regressive argument, proof requiring more proof and more proof endlessly, or an axiomatic argument where plain acceptance is required. Any of these three will be in a way unsatisfying. Now I say for example the following statement. In regards to any action we are to study everything related to that action as being consequential, thus being the consequences everything that determines that action as either good or bad. Now that statement I said. I don't see that circular statement as any less credible or less founded than this other statement, which is axiomatic. Human life is sacred, the right to live is inalienable. Or choose any other axiomatic argument you defend. They're both basic fundamental reasonings that either you agree with them or you don't. So if you choose any of the two as being better or more useful, it is because for you it is that way. Yet you will know that that is not the case for others. I do not agree and many others like me disagree with human life being sacred. Human life in itself is not sacred. We don't have the alienable right to live or insert here any axiomatic statement of your choice. I do not agree with that axiomatic statement. So if you want your ethics to be affected onto others, you will have to take those different approaches into account, not dismiss them whether they use one type of argument or the other. Now, following your example of someone in Asia. It is true that in utilitarianism all pleasure is to be taken into account. Yet if you say that something you do yourself, in that example, will have absolutely no effect on Asian people, by the mere definition of consequentialism, the pleasure or pain that might cause to Asian people is irrelevant, since there is no pleasure or pain caused. With no consequences whatsoever, there is no ethical relevance, you need not worry. There is no gaping metaphysical hole there. Now, right after that, you ask, what about taking into account unknown sentient beings, such as extraterrestrial life forms? You say that a consequentialist would answer to that with, other life forms have no relevance to us because they don't affect us. And you find that answer laughable. I'm happy that you're amused by such an answer, but that is not the answer an actual utilitarianist would give, or it's a reductionist one. 
in few prevailing instances, yet not as scarcely or ridiculing as you approach it, utilitarianists think of possible ways to improve pleasure beyond our present earth, including pleasure in artificial life forms, computerized realities, currently poorly understood species on earth, multiple or parallel universes, or extraterrestrial life forms. If you need references for that, just search Google or ask me. In general, no utilitarianist would dare to say that we do not affect in any way those life forms or that they do not affect us. Similarly, no utilitarianist would dare to say that what we do in a different country does not affect in any way people in Asia. That is the reasoning you are using yourself, proving wrong your own reasonings, not the general stance of utilitarianists. As for utilitarianism making morality change, or utilitarianism going along moral changes, isn't that how it has always been? Morality doesn't stay the same. A Christian of the present doesn't have the same moral stances as a Christian of 2000 years ago. Morality changes with time. These changes are not arbitrary, as you say. They respond to social needs, to discoveries, to inventions, to political situations, and thus wanting to have a morality that is not flexible or that doesn't change with time is a lost cause. Furthermore, given that utilitarianism attempts to maximize benefit, the utilitarian position encourages wisdom, encourages knowledgeable ponderings, studying current situations and future consequences or conditions. That it goes against the notion of whim or capricious, easily exchangeable perceived pleasures you associate with it. Our notion of pleasure might change in the future. If that's the case, then that has to be taken into account too. In general, the closer a happening, the easier it is to predict it, and based on ethics, prevent it or support it. The problem that can arise here, as you point out, is that it is impossible for us to take into account every possible outcome, situation, pleasure or pain regarding sentient beings. But that shouldn't stop us from trying. Let me use an example. If we were to confidently know that saving a person's life now where to cause the death of 30 other people, because of that person being a terrorist or a criminal, as much as you or we hold that his life is valuable and holy, we would consider taking his life now to be more ethical than having him kill 30 other people later. And we know that in that situation, that choice is the better one, or if the death of the criminal is unavoidable, the best one, because we've considered, as far as our abilities let us, all the possible outcomes or future conditions that we would otherwise not know if we didn't make the effort to know or predict in that criminal scenario. So trying to predict all possible outcomes within our limited abilities or time is ethically significant. If we don't make the effort to know, to be prepared, we are risking not being as ethical as we could be. Also, for the record, if it is not possible to consider the pleasure that is not of one's own, to which I do not agree, given the role of empathy, then, given that same degree of skepticism or critique in issues regarding reality, it is not possible to consider the reality that is not one's own, giving full way to solipsism, something I assume you don't encourage. To conclude this video, I want to study, more or less separately, the hypothetical case you propose of a homeless man you call Bill. You say he has no means to survive until the end of the week. I would suppose you mean by this that any help to him is unavailable, even the help of someone within the hospital. It would seem that everyone is very poor, or no one in the hospital is a charitable Christian or a utilitarianist with resources. So, anyway, he will die in a matter of days. Yet it happens to be that most organ transplants are prepared within weeks, months or even years of waiting for the right organ to be available, in a way that the most urgent need for organs are satisfied by priority with the donated organs most available at the moment. In most cases in which a person is confidently given only a few days left to live, there is no immediate need for donated organs that cannot already be met. A utilitarianist most of the times would choose to let the man live the few days he has left and once dead take his organs. So, for a utilitarianist to want to kill a homeless man it would have to happen first that the man is confidently given only a few days to live, 
Second, that there is a need for organs that cannot be met already. And third, that the need for those organs not being met cannot wait the few days that the man still has left to live. In which case, killing the man painlessly and using his organs would be good, as long as those organs make the patients in need survive more time than the homeless man would, and if the medicine professional isn't punished for doing it. As I understand it, as stated in your video, you disagree with...